Thank you for the opportunity to present at SUMS 2020. My name is Jayadev Atreya. I'm at the University of Washington. And I'm gonna tell a story today about some joint work with my friends David Alessino and Pat Hooper. Uh, and it's gonna be a story that hopefully suggests that thinking deeply about even objects that we feel like we're really familiar with, kind of things that we you know, know, we feel like we know well as mathematicians can still yield all kinds of interesting and awesome mathematics. So the title of the talk is The Yellow Brick Road. That will refer to a path that we find on a certain shape towards the end. That name was suggested by Brady Heron, who is the person who makes the number file videos. Um, I had the opportunity to make a number file video about this particular result. So you're welcome to check that out as well. I'll get that link sent out. Well, let's go ahead and get started with some math. So this talk is gonna be about platonic solids. Uh, platonic solids are a generalization of regular polygons. So when you start, you know, maybe in kindergarten or in first grade, you start to learn about, okay, well, there are triangles and there are triangles who have all their sides equal to each other. We call those equilateral. There are quadrilaterals, all of whose sides are equal to each other. We call those squares. And in two dimensions, there's sort of regular n-gons for any n. You can make a polygon with n sides for any n. But what if you go up and you want something living in three dimensions, that so it's sort of a two-dimensional object living in three dimensions, that has all of its faces are exactly the same, all of its edges are the same length, and each corner has the same number of faces coming together at it. Then it turns out that there's only five of these things. Um, you guys have maybe seen these before. These are called the platonic solids. There are, there's the tetrahedron there on the left. There's the octahedron, which has eight faces. Uh, sorry, yeah, eight faces, uh, but only six vertices. There's the cube, which has six vertices and eight faces, sorry, six faces and eight vertices. It's kind of the reverse. Uh, then you have the icosahedron, and then down below by itself, you have the dodecahedron. And you'll see why I, I keep the dodecahedron kind of down there on its own. Um, if you've played any kind of tabletop games, you know these as various kinds of dice. So this would be, these are all, one has four faces, then the standard cube has six, the octahedron is a D8. The uh, icosahedron would be a D20, and the dodecahedron would be a D12. But so these are lovely, lovely shapes. And what we're going to think about is we're going to think about what would it be like to live on the surface of one of these shapes? So what would living on these shapes be like? In particular, what we're going to think about is we have a house at each vertex or each corner. And now what we want to do is, let's say, you know, in these days of social distancing, maybe we want to get some exercise. So we want to go for a run. And we're very efficient runners. We want to run along straight lines. And then if we hit the edge of one of these uh, faces, we're just going to keep running straight over it. It's just like the ridge of a hill. Um, and we want to avoid everyone else's house, and we want to sort of come back to where we start. We never really want to change direction. Go for a run, and then come back home. So go for a run in a straight line. And come back home without passing through anyone else's house. Another way of putting this is, if you think about these as planets, um, there is one of my favorite children's books is the book, The Little Prince. And in The Little Prince, one of the central tensions, other than the loss of childhood innocence, is there is a prince who lives on the small planet and there's a rose. And the prince has a sheep and he's a very responsible pet owner. He wants to take the sheep for a walk, uh, but doesn't want the sheep to eat the rose. So you could imagine our planet as we live at one house with the sheep, then at every other corner, there is a rose and we wanna take our sheep for a walk without ever having it walk by a rose. 
um, and, and having it tempted to eat the roses. We want to preserve the roses. So that's another way of framing this problem that we're, we're interested in. Um, so question is, on which platonic solids, if any, can we do this? So when, where, which platonic solid, if any, is it safe to be an antisocial jogger or is it safe to take your sheep for a walk? And if so, how do we do that? So it turns out this problem was thought about, it goes back at least 100 years. Um, this paper by Paul Stackel, this is from 1906. Paul Stackel was a professor of mathematics in Hanover. That's his picture. That's not actually part of the paper. Um, it would be nice if in math papers you could get a little sense of who was writing them. Um, I, I sort of just glued these together here. Um, for those of you who can read some German, it's right there. He's talking about ordinary polyhedra. And the title of the paper is Geodesic Lines on Polyhedra. Um, and he asks basically a version of this question. And uh, also his colleague, uh, Carl Rodenberg, at Hanover also thought about this question. Both of these papers were in 1906. At the very bottom of this paper, you can see he refers to his colleague, uh, Herr Stockel. Um, and uh, you can see both places, Paul Stockel in 19, you know, both these papers. So they're, they're talking about different approaches. You see other famous names in here, like Mobius right there. Um, and, and so you see a lot, and you see Euler's name here. You see a lot of names that people have thought about polyhedra. But here they're thinking about exactly this question of what they call geodesic lines. So you have your polyhedra, polyhedron, which is flat. And you think about that as giving you a notion of distance. And geodesics are going to be paths that locally minimize this distance. For us, you could, if you don't want to think about all of that, just think about straight lines. We're going to think about straight line paths that start at one corner and come back to that same corner without ever hitting another corner. The question is, do these exist? And it turns out um, that for several of them, they do not. So there are no closed singular geodesics. None of these straight paths that start at one corner and then come back to where it starts without passing through another corner. We call these closed singular geodesics. There aren't any on the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the cube, and the icosahedron. So that, those are those four um, ones that sat at the top of the picture. So if you see it here, those are, those are the, these four, right? So we can write their names down here if we want to remember. This is the tetrahedron. This is the octahedron. This is the cube. This is the icosahedron. And then down here we have our dodecahedron. All of these are basically the Greek, except for the cube, they're the Greek name for the, num the Greek number and then the number of faces. Okay, so again, there are no closed singular geodesics on the tetrahedron, octahedron, cube, and icosahedron. So you cannot be an, an efficient antisocial jogger on any of these planets. And you can't take your sheep for a straight line walk and come back home on a loop without changing direction, without passing through someone else's house. That's, so these planets are not good if you wanna save your roses or if you wanna be an antisocial dog. So I wanna actually sketch you know, a proof of this result just in the case of a tetrahedron uh, and then indicate how this proof can be used, modified to the other solids um, because it's actually quite a lovely idea. It uses an idea coming from this beautiful paper of Ralph Fox and Richard Kirshner. Up there you have, here is, that's Fox, and to the right is Kirshner. Now, these guys are quite interesting, actually. This paper was written long before these photos were taken. They were, uh, this paper was written when they were uh, graduate students, early graduate students, master students at Johns Hopkins University. Fox went on to become a very famous mathematician, uh, he had also, in addition to being professor at Princeton, he advised many famous students, including John Milner, uh, who some of you may have heard of. Kirshner went into in a more applied direction and became quite literally a rocket scientist, ended up working at Johns Hopkins. 
making uh, a division on rocket propulsion. Uh, and so uh, maybe it does take a rocket scientist to study uh, some of these problems. They introduced this paper in 1933. Um, you can see already that there's still a lot of German words in the paper, but this one's now written in English. Um, they introduced the idea of unfolding. So let me try and demonstrate for you this idea of unfolding just with the tetrahedron. So of course, I can draw the tetrahedron in a couple of different ways. I could draw it, kind of try and draw it in kind of a 3D picture where there it is, there's that thing in the back. But what I'm gonna instead gonna do, and we're, you know, we're interested in maybe starting at this red guy, and maybe we go sort of straight over this edge, and then we wanna come around the back. Uh oh, we ran into another corner. That's not so good. Um, but I want, what I want to do is I want to give you a way of cutting out a piece of paper and putting it together to make a tetrahedron, a so-called net for the tetrahedron. And this is actually really very simple. We make, we take an equilateral triangle, we kind of make folds, uh, we, we inscribe an equilateral triangle on the inside, we take just connecting the midpoints of the edges, and then we, we think about folding up. If you fold along those folds, then when you glue up to the top, uh, you're gonna get a tetrahedron. Um, so for instance, uh, you know, but we can, we can also say that there's gonna be some identifications of the sides, right? So this side is gonna get glued to that side, this to this, and then this guy pointing in to this guy. So this is how once you fold it up, all of these guys are going to be glued. Um, and I'm just going to peek ahead to make sure I get my colors consistent here. Let's see, red, blue. Okay. So let's use blue. All notice that these three corners, when I glue it together, will collapse to one point. Then I'm going to have. Oh, so that's going to be my blue. Then I'm going to make another color. This guy is going to be yellow. And this guy on the bottom here is going to be pink. That's its own corner. And then this guy here is going to be red. So if I want to sort of assemble this, what the picture would kind of look like is I'd have these kind of dashed lines on the bottom. And then I would have my edges coming up to the top like this. And on top, I'd have my blue corner and the way I've drawn it I'd have my pink my yellow and my red when I assemble this but I actually want to think about this as a flat piece of paper and now what I want to do is I don't like so for instance if I were to try and model what traveling along would be like so maybe I'm, I'm traveling along and I hit this but then I have to come out this way I have to sort of so I was going this way, I come out going this way. I kind of have to, on this thing, it looks like I'm kind of changing direction. Or if I were to sort of, you know, come into this, to this side here, I come out, you know, with this angle going out here like that. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to never have to change direction. I'd like to sort of keep being able to keep going straight. And so instead of what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this original picture and I'm gonna kind of just double it along this side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna draw another copy of this thing. So I'm gonna try and keep track of the colors the same way. So just drawing an, another copy, just rotated 180 degrees from the original. So this yellow becomes this yellow here. This, um, the pink on the bottom becomes the pink on the top. And then this red fellow here stays here. And of course, you know, you can think about having the, the dashed lines in here, but I, you don't need to think about that. Um, and what I do want to emphasize is you have these guys are this side, and then we have these guys on the outside here. And then we have these guys pointing towards the middle here. And so I've drawn this thing. So instead of crossing over an edge, what I could do, instead of going here and coming up here, instead of sort of going in there, I could just continue on and think about that instead of going in my original copy, I just go in this new copy. But then what happens is now look, every side kind of has a friend. I, I, I could actually kind of glue these things together. And now what I'm gonna get is I'm gonna get a parallelogram and there's gonna be this 
red point in the middle, there's going to be these, what looks like these two pink points, but be careful, we're, we're, the two pink points are not actually gonna end up being different. We're gonna have these two blue points, and then we're gonna have these yellow points again. But what, what's happening now is, let me actually use some colors for the sides. Maybe I'll use, so this side now is the same as this side. And maybe I won't use pink, maybe I'll use electric green here. This electric green side is glued to this bottom electric green side. So we've gone from a tetrahedron to if those, if, those of you who've seen this before, seen you know gluing opposite sides. If you take a piece of paper and you glue sort of the left to the right, you'll get a tube, and then you glue the top to the bottom, you get the surface of a donut. So this thing ends up looking like the surface of a donut. It's got uh, kind of a, a blue curve going around one thing, and it's got this green uh, electric green curve going around the other way, and on the where the electric curve, green curve, and the blue curve meet, you have your blue point, you have your pink point on the green curve, and then you have your uh, your your uh, uh, red point right in. The, you have your yellow point on the other side of the blue curve, and then you have your red point just sort of smack in the middle here, which I'm going to draw kind of right there. And now the question is, you know, we have this, of course, I've drawn it kind of curvy, but I'm still thinking of it as flat. We're going to do one more step of quote unquote unfolding here. What we're going to do is we're going to take the, this picture here with the, the dots and we're going to develop it into the plane. So now we have our plane picture. We have our blue dots here. We have, so I could, I could highlight, for instance, I used, I think, um, I think I used, yeah, light blue and electric green, or sort of electric blue and electric green. So you had kind of electric blue there and electric green there. And then I, I could tile the plane with this electric blue, electric green picture. Um, right, so these, these lines are gonna be kind of electric blue lines. I'll draw. And then we'll have these electric green lines, which are these kind of the horizontal lines are gonna be electric green. Maybe I've made them a little bit thicker. Um, right. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, well, what does it mean to say start at the blue corner and end up back at the blue corner? Well, what I would have to do is I'd have to draw a straight line in this picture that goes from one blue dot to another blue dot. But now I don't want it to pass through a red dot, a yellow dot, or a pink dot. And you might say, okay, maybe you can do that. Maybe, maybe I want to go from this blue dot to this blue dot. Uh-oh, that's going to pass me through a, a pink dot. Maybe I want to go from this blue to this blue. Uh-oh, I passed through a red dot. Maybe I want to go to, you know, um, this blue down, or maybe let's say this blue down there, I'm going to actually end up passing through two yellow dots. And you can convince yourself that to go from blue to blue, you're going to have to pass through a red, a yellow, or a pink. To go from pink to pink, you'll have to pass through a red, a yellow, or a blue. These dots block each other off from being seen, which said you cannot go from start to finish on this, um, on this uh, uh, tetrahedron. You cannot go from where you started back to where, you cannot come back to where you started going on a straight line without passing through someone else's house. I find this really beautiful and really remarkable. Okay, now it's not as simple uh, for the other platonic solids. So with this one, what did we do? We unfolded it. Uh, we took the net for the tetrahedron. We, un we, we, did, we took two copies of it because when we glued things in the net, we had to rotate things 180 degrees or two pi divided by two. That's why we took two copies. And then we glued everything kind of just by parallel translation and we got a surface. In this case, we got a torus in the, in the, in the tetrahedron case. And then we analyzed what happened on that surface. Now that's the game we're gonna play with all of the other solids as well. 
we're going to start, for instance, you know, here's a picture of the cube. Maybe I start with this zeroth copy of the cube. This is a net for the cube. Uh, and you can tell it's a net for the cube if you've ever moved, right? If you've ever assembled a box. Um, and then here the B side is glued to the B side, the A to the A, the D to the D, the F to the F, and the G to the G. So these sides are the ones that are going to come together. And then when I do that, I'm of course sometimes having to glue like these D sides are at a 90 degree angle, which is 2 pi divided by 4. So I take four copies of the square, of the cube, excuse me. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to glue now each copy, so there's D0 here, and now I'm going to rotate it so that you know D3 becomes horizontal, um, just like it was here, and that's going to be my new D0. So this is the rotated copy, so this D0 is, ends up getting glued to this D0. And all of the matchups, all the the, the the, the sides have a friend where you can glue it just by parallel translation without ever changing direction. So now this thing, this picture, even though it doesn't look like it, is a picture of a surface where you just travel. So for instance, you know, maybe I started, I'll start, you know, maybe I started over here and copy two, and then I go and I say, oh, I hit F2. Now I look where F2 is, F2 is down here, and I'll come, oh, and I hit D3, good. And now I look for where is D3, D3 is here. Okay, so now I keep going straight. Now I've hurt, hit D2. Now, where was B2? B2 is down here. Now I've hit C2. Where is C2? C2 is here again. And aha, I've come back and I've kind of closed up. But notice that I didn't start in a corner. So here I closed up, but I didn't start in a corner. First of all, what, you know, there's a lot of questions you should be asking here and that I hope I hear from you on actually the day of the talk, of, of when we interact in December, which is, you know, what the hell is this thing supposed to look like? What do I mean by kind of this traveling straight? It turns out that this particular surface is, looks like a torus, except it has many, many more holes. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's what's called a genus nine surface. Um, and what we have to do is we have to now analyze all the possible straight line trajectories on this genus nine surface. But we're lucky in the sense that this genus nine surface is what's called arithmetic. It's, while it, it itself is not a torus, it's very closely related. It's like the cousin of a torus. The precise words are, it's a branched cover of the torus, branched over zero. And so a lot of the stuff we did on the torus, we can use and we can analyze using the same techniques on the cube, the icosahedron and the octahedron. Because, basically because the faces of those polyhedra tile the plane. That's something that ends up helping us analyze. Okay, so I said the faces of those polyhedra tile the plane. Well, what about the dodecahedron? The dodecahedron, its faces are pentagons. Pent regular pentagons. Regular pentagons do not tile the plane. If you've never worked that out, I urge you to work that out. It's a beautiful exercise in matching up angles to see that regular pentagons do not tile the plane. So whatever we were using in these for these other solids, we cannot do it for the dodecahedron. So is it true? Is there always such a, is, is there such a trajectory for the dodecahedron? Or, you know, does it fail for some other reason? And the answer is, there is. So this was the first trajectory was found by myself and my friend David Olesino. Um, I know I called the talk the yellow brick road, but in our picture we had this very nice red line. This red line passes through this back vertex here, and you go straight on it, and you you follow this around and you come back to where you started so you just you're just going straight over these edges and you come back to where you started this is a close we call, sometimes call it a saddle connection or a closed singular geodesic on the dodecahedron okay here is the picture the analogous picture for the tetrahedron we got a surface with one hole we only needed two copies of the net 
this is the net for the dodecahedron, and then there are 10 copies indexed to zero through nine, because when you take a dodecahedron and put it together, you have to glue things together with rotations of angle two pi over five, uh, sorry, excuse me, two pi over 10. So you need 10 copies of this guy. And so here are the 10 copies. I love this picture. We call it sometimes the snowflake picture um, because it kind of looks like a fancy snowflake, even though that's maybe a little bit misleading because snowflakes are supposed to have, I think, hexagonal symmetry and this doesn't. This has rotation by order 10. And now, if you sort of peer carefully, every side has a, has a parallel front. Uh, again, the sort of the, the letters represent what would be glued on one net, and then the numbers represent different copies. So for instance, suppose I started on the zero, on the zero net, and I just started going up. Oops, let me maybe I'll use green like I did for the previous one. So then I hit B0. So now I need to look and see, okay, where is this other B0? So I know it's going to be horizontal somewhere. Um, and I know it's going to be sort of a rotated copy of the other B. So that was a B4. I turn it and I want it to be horizontal. Um, so I think, ooh, always, always tricky to do this on the fly. Ah, here it is. There's the other B0. So I keep going straight up there. So maybe I shouldn't have done it right in the middle. Maybe I'll, I'll think about it as, as um, slightly to the maybe, I go and I go slightly to the right of the middle. And then I come here and I go slightly to the right. And now I hit D4. And now I need to see where the other D4 is. So it's going to be going kind of this way. Um, so I think, yes, it's in just in the very next copy. So now I'm just going to go up from here. And maybe I go up and I hit G5. And now I need to see where this horizontal G5 is. So G5 is, where's the other G? It's G1. So if I rotate it like that, that should become horizontal, G0. Well, I think you get the idea. You can keep searching. There is a G5 here. Uh, probably watching me search for it on the fly is not what any of you signed up for, but you can keep going and you'll, you'll, you'll sort of track these trajectories. Now, what's awesome about this is that this, um, this surface is not related. It's not cousins with the torus. However, what it is cousins with is something called the double pentagon. So this double pentagon is exactly what it sounds like. It's two pentagons, and you glue the sides, A, B, C, and D. And now what you get is you get what's called a genus two surface out of this. And, but it has one singular point. If you look at all of, the, like that's the left side of, of D, so it's here, that's this side of C, so it's here, that's this side of B, so it's here, this side of A, so it's here. Now it's that side of D. All of these eight corners collapse to one point. And if you look at the angles here, the interior angle of a pentagon is three pi over five. So when you add these up, six pi over five, three pi over five, three pi over five. 3 pi over 5. Well, when you add these up, you get this one point with angle 6 pi. So you get this singular point. Um, in fact, I really love this dodecahedral surface. Uh, sorry, this, this uh, a double pentagon surface. I like it so much, I actually got a tattoo of it. I don't know if you guys can see that there. There we go. Um, I was studying it in a different context. I didn't necessarily expect it to pop up when I was studying this, but I was very happy when it popped up when I was studying the dodecahedron. It made me, uh, it was something familiar. It was something that, you know, uh, it was a connection to something I had done before. And I'm sure, you know, those of you who are, since you're doing, you know, research in mathematics and you're thinking about math, there's that great uh, excitement when you're working on something and it connects to something you've done before. It connects to something you already know. And that creates this kind of great excitement because it's like, wait a minute, there's something happening here. Um, so let me make a couple of remarks about this. One of the things that's very exciting is this double pentagon has lots of hidden, and these are, to be technical, they are called affine symmetries. What does that mean? It means there's a matrix uh, a linear transformation that you can hit the whole picture with 
then that and then you can there's lots of these matrices that you can then cut and reassemble back into the original shape since i'm not great at drawing freehand let me give you an example for the square torus so if i took the square torus and i think about this as sort of the vector one zero and this is the vector zero one and now i hit this with the matrix one one zero one that leaves one zero invariant, but it sends one zero to one one. One one, and then this is still one zero. But now what I can do is I could cut this along this red line, and then I can reassemble it because now this is glued to this, and this is glued to this. If I cut it along the red line and reassemble it, what I get uh, is, uh, let me draw it a little bit better. So I have this red. If I cut it and reassemble it, I get this, this reassembled picture where that's this line and this top line is staying exactly the same. Basically, it gets mapped right back to the torus. Um, so in the torus case, you get this group of outline symmetries. It's actually the group generated by the matrices 1, 1, 0, 1. And by turning the picture 90 degrees, you get the matrix 1, 0, 1, 1. That group turns out to have a name. It's the group of two by two matrices with determinant one and entries in the integer called SL2Z. For the double pentagon, you get a very similar group. It's not quite SL2Z, but it is. It's very, very closely related. I'm going to tell a slight lie. It's basically the group generated by this matrix, which is rotation by uh, uh, basically 180 degrees or 90 degrees, depending on your perspective. Um, and then it's one golden ratio, 0, 1. Here, B is one plus the square root of five over two. Maybe it's not so surprising that the golden ratio shows up when you're studying the pentagon. This group has a name for those of you who, who like these things. It's called the HECA two five infinity triangle group. Now, why do I keep going on about the fact that it has a lot of symmetries? The fact that it has a lot of symmetries means that we can, uh, the, some, many of the properties we care about, being a straight line trajectory that comes back to where you started without passing through another corner, are invariant under this group of symmetries. So what we can do is we get to then analyze, we can analyze one thing instead of having to analyze sort of infinitely many things. Um, the, the, the action of this group allows us to, in fact, reduce our problem to doing to something that's amenable to a computer search. So I want to emphasize actually that we use heavily in finding this a computer search. We've proved our theorems, but we did a lot of this finding using Python, in fact using a program called Sage, which is Python with a bunch of built-in math libraries, and in particular using something called a, a computer package called Flat Surf inside of Sage which was developed by our friends Vincent Lacrosse, Samuel Lelievre, and many others. Without that, I don't think this research would have been possible. So this research is very much, uh, you know, based on, you know, our, our ability to get the answer was based on our ability to find a computer, uh, to use it, to reduce this to a computer search. And using that computer search, um, myself, David Alcino, and Pat Hooper, prove that up to that sort of a natural notion of equivalence, this affine equivalence, there are 31 equivalence classes of these objects we care about. These, what we call closed saddle connections or uh, closed singular geodesics, and 422 maximal cylinders. So these are uh, trajectories that don't pass through a corner but still close up. Those sweep out kind of cylinders in the surface, and there's a lot of those. So this was, you know, these are big numbers, but it's kind of really fun to have, to have done this project. I can tell you exactly what all of those vectors are. I can tell you exactly what they look like. In fact, here is a list of all the exact vectors for the 31 different equivalence classes. Um, and uh, those are some exact numbers. We have an approximate vector and an approximate length for all of these, where we normalize the edges of the pentagon to have length two. Um, and then there's a coset representative in terms of the orbit of this of this HECA group, but don't worry too much about that. Anyway, this is a table just to prove that you can sort of you can actually explicitly list everything. 
but I promised lots and lots of pictures. So here are some pictures. This is the net of the dodecahedron with the very first one. This is maybe, I think, the third one in that list, maybe the fifth one. These are some of the higher ones. Uh, you can see they're kind of getting more and more complicated. Ooh, this one's crossing itself a whole bunch of times. Even more times um, it, it's crossing. And you can see, you know, they, they start to get more and more and more complicated, and they kind of fill up more and more and more of the surface. Um, and you can kind of see these in these wireframe pictures as well, where we, we draw them kind of going around. There's some crazy looking ones. That one really fills up a lot of the thing. Um, and then finally, let me actually show you this. We've created a, a website um, based on these objects. Uh, this is based on some really nice, you know, uh, work by, by by Pat in particular. So let me share this web page with you. Um, just a second here. So share screen. There we go. So you can see now this website about the dodecahedron. Um, and we show you, you can sort of see it spinning around. Um, and you can turn it around and view it from different angles. And this is the very first representative. And now there's the second guy. There's the third equivalence class. There's the fourth. Let's go back a little bit. And then you can see the 31st one, which is much, much longer. And then I'll also direct you to, there's an article in, if you're interested in further reading about the subject, you can read our article, but you can also find uh, an article about our work in Quanta Magazine. So, um, so you can find, uh, let's see, I'll just pull it up here for you. Um, so if you, you can see there's a lovely article by Erica Clarike, who's a wonderful writer about mathematics, who does, who explains this in a really lovely way. Um, and in it, you can also find an embedded YouTube video where I go over some of this stuff in conversation with Brady Heron, um, which you guys might enjoy as well. Brady has also put together some fantastic animation about this. Um, so I look forward to talking to you all on December 5th. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this lecture. I hope it was fun, and I hope you guys are all staying safe and healthy no matter where you are. Thank you, and I will see you on December 5th. Bye.